For our second lesson, it's Thursday night, and the evening before Jesus' crucifixion. He knows he will soon be leaving his disciples to fulfill his mission and wants them to be prepared. And he has been teaching his disciples across chapters 14, 15, and 16 of John about his mission, his nature, his destiny, and about their role in, uh, in all of this. And now here in chapter 17, he prays for them. Now what does he pray for? Not that it will be easy. He knows it won't be. This world is captive to an alien spirit, a spirit alien to God's spirit. It is animated by a sense of scarcity instead of abundance, by fear instead of courage, by selfishness instead of sacrifice. And Jesus, the one who came to bring abundant life, who does not run in the face of danger, who lays down his life for his sheep, offers an alternative vision of reality. This is the reason the world hates Jesus and will hate those who follow him. So, so Jesus does not pray that it will be easy, but rather that God will support each of the disciples amid their challenges and that they will be one, that they will be one in fellowship with each other and with Jesus and the Father through the Spirit. Listen as I read, beginning with John chapter 17, verse 6. I have revealed you to those whom you gave me out of the world. They were yours, you gave them to me, and they have obeyed your word. Now they know that everything you have given me comes from you. For I gave them the words you gave me, and they accepted them. They knew with certainty that I came from you, and they believed that you sent me. I pray for them. I am not praying for the world, but for those you have given me, for they are yours. All I have is yours, and all you have is mine, and glory has come to me through them. I will remain in the world no longer, but they are still in the world, and I am coming to you. Holy Father, protect them by the power of your name, the name you gave me, so that they may be one as we are one. While I was with them, I protected them and kept them safe by that name you gave me. None has been lost except the one doomed to destruction so that scripture would be fulfilled. I am coming to you now, but I say these things while I am still in the world so that they may have the full measure of my joy within them. I have given them your word, and the world has hated them, for they are not of the world any more than I am of the world. My prayer is not that you take them out of the world, but that you protect them from the evil one. They are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. Sanctify them by the truth. Your word is truth. As you have sent me into the world, I have sent them into the world. For them I sanctify myself that they too may be truly sanctified. The grass withers and the flower fades, but the word of our God stands forever. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Probably you know that there are three main branches of Islam. Sunni, Shia, and Sufi, all of them organized around and drawing guidance from various schools of uh, Islamic jurisprudence. Of course, these three have divided and subdivided. Some Muslim groups have become extinct. Some are very, very new. There are non-denominational Muslims. There are Anglo-Muslims whose congregations originated here in the United States. All told, there are about 150 Islamic denominations with approximately one billion adherents. 
Now there are four main branches of Christianity. Roman Catholic, Eastern Orthodox, Protestant, and some folks will separate out Pentecostalism as the fourth. There are more than two billion Christians in the world today. About one half of them are Roman Catholic. So there are about a billion Catholics, about 240 million Eastern Orthodox Christians, and then the Protestants and Pentecostals comprise another 750 million or so. How many Christian denominations do you think there are? Care to guess? <laughs> there are 150 Muslim denominations. Now there are only a couple of Catholic groups, so half of all Christians, half of all Christian denominations can be counted on one hand. All the Orthodox think they are part of the same denomination. All of them can then be lumped together with the Roman Catholics on one hand. That leaves the 750 million Protestants. At last count, Philip Jenkins, a recently retired professor of church history at Baylor University in Texas, totaled up just over 43,000 Christian denominations. 43,000. And more are springing up every day. Here in John chapter 17, Jesus prayed that we might be one. It would appear that his prayer was unanswered. His prayer was unanswered. I read a story about a pastor whose five-year-old daughter noticed that her father always paused and bowed his head for a moment before starting his sermons. One day she asked him why. He said, well, honey, proud that she had been so observant of what he did before preaching. He said, I'm asking the Lord to help me preach a good sermon. And then she said, well, how come he doesn't do it? <laughs> After nearly every Presbytery meeting I have attended for the past decade, my wife has asked me when I got home, who's leaving now? We went out to eat last week and the owner of the restaurant stopped by our table and asked how it was. When she found out that we were Presbyterians, she proudly told us that her son was a Presbyterian too and that he was one of the right ones that had left our denomination. Last month I did some advanced sermon preparation and sent Jason and Susan a few ideas about my sermons for the weeks to come and when I read the gospel lectionary for today I commented to them that this might be a difficult passage for us to consider. Jesus prayed that we might be one. What on earth has happened? The prayer Jesus prays for his disciples is chronologically ordered. If you want to go back and take a look, he, he prays for himself in the first five verses, for his immediate disciples in verses 6 through 19, and for future disciples, for us, in verse 20 and following that they might be one, as found in verse 11, has to do with the remaining 11 disciples. Judas is left. He asked that they, those 11, might be protected and sanctified even as they are sent in the world to be in the world but not of it. We are included in verse 21, and it's, and it seems that the original disciples are meant to be a model 
for those of us who come later. There are so many questions here. The unity Jesus prayed for simply can't be organic or organizational or denominational. And yet it had to be visible enough to challenge the world to believe in Jesus. So it was more than a spiritual oneness, but what did he mean? Raymond Brown says John's statements about unity imply both a horizontal and a vertical dimension. The unity involves the relation of the believers to the Father and to the Son and the relationship of the believers to each other. So it's, it's both, and yet it isn't simply human fellowship. The scholars have just gone berserk over this. I, I, I quit. I quit looking, but this is, is the unity a question of united purpose expressing itself in a common Christian mission and message? Is it a question of Christians harmoniously working together without dissidence? Is the union of Christians with each other and with Christ pattern on a union that exists between persons, say between a husband and wife or between parents and children? Is unity achieved through a unique character of God's image in the consciousness of every believer? Is it related to communion somehow? And, and it just goes on and on and on. I'll tell you what I think. I'll tell you what I think. Whatever else it is, unity is not uniformity. It is not followers of Jesus in lockstep devotion and practice and theology without deviation on every possible topic related to every possible situation. It is not uniformity. Remember, Jesus prayed that we might be one even as he and the Father are one, and theologians have waxed eloquent for millennia over the Father and the Son remaining distinct persons despite their unity. I think it's this, and I'm no theologian, but this is what I think. We are one in that as Christians, we relate to and are related to the same person. At the center of our faith is Jesus Christ, Jesus of Nazareth, Jesus our Lord, our rock, our redeemer, even, even our friend. He is the only tie that binds us together. We are one in him. And our relationship with him is not, cannot be, identical with each other's relationship with him. It simply isn't possible. Peter, James, and John had a closeness with Jesus that Matthew, Bartholomew, and Andrew, and the others didn't have. And yet, why do we demand that everyone have the same experience of Jesus or make the same confession? Let me tell you about a friend of mine. A great friend of mine, his name was, was Jim Hollinsworth. He died a few years ago at the age of 97. He was a school teacher, taught math and geology. He helped found the Outward Bound program in the state of North Carolina. He was the founder of the outdoor program at Asheville School. Well into his 80s, he was the treasurer of the American Camping Association. His nickname was Pop, Pop Hollinsworth. I met him when he was already in his middle 70s. He was the first person to join Enslow Park Presbyterian Church in Huntington, West Virginia after I became the pastor there. I soon learned that he liked to backpack. I did too. So we went hiking together and eventually I was asked to join him and some friends on a trip up Mount Leconte in the winter. 
was the last weekend of January, 1994, I think. On that excursion, I made several new lifelong friends. But I had known Pop for only a few months. Most of the others had known him for years at Asheville School or an Outward Bound or the American Camping Association. Some taught with him, one grew up with him. Others had been taught by him. Some he met along the way, like me. We were different ages. We were different in our camping and back, backpacking experiences. We had different skill levels. And quite frankly, we had varying degrees of commitment to the whole enterprise. I mean, it was cold up there. But the one thing that all of us had in common was a relationship with Pop. As long as we belonged to him, we were one. We are Christians. Jesus Christ is the center of our faith. And apart from him, we have no faith. Everything that we say, do, believe, or confess as a result of our faith is actually secondary to our relationship with him. You hear that? Everything that we say, do, believe, or confess as a result of our faith is actually secondary to the object of our faith itself. I suppose this brings us back now to what went wrong. I mean, 43,000 Protestant denominations later, what happened? Somewhere along the line, and it was fairly early in its history, the church forgot that Christian community has two dimensions, just like the unity that Christ prayed had two dimensions, that it had a vertical dimension and a horizontal dimension. With God the vertical and with one another the horizontal. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, strength, and soul. Love your neighbor as yourself, vertical and horizontal. Christian community must have both if it is to be both Christian and community. And this vertical and the horizontal is described by sociologists as bonding and bridging. Bonding and bridging. Bonding. Churches bond really, really well. Bonding is backpacking together. It's, it's worshiping together. It's fellowshipping. It's coming alongside each other. It's learning about each other and so forth. That's bonding. When we bond, our differences are mitigated and smoothed over and, and even ignored sometimes. There is tremendous pressure not to rock the boat. There's peer pressure to approve of everything the community does. Churches are very, very good at bonding together. But the problem is that if churches focus, if groups focus so much on bonding, what happens is that those who don't quite see it the way the majority does are excluded and can be ostracized and even demonized. Even in the church this happens. And quite frankly, our history in the Christian church suggests that especially in the church this happens. Bonding cannot be the exclusive focus of the Christian community. There must constantly be bridging, reaching out, including the other, realizing that unity does not mean uniformity and that if diversity exists in the Trinity itself, surely it is meant to exist in our congregations. Jesus himself spent an extraordinary amount of time with his disciples alone bonding and reaching out to those on the edges, those marginalized by Jewish life, which is bridging. 
I have a dear friend in Knoxville. Her name is Jean Delaney, and she's one of those Protestant Pentecostal pastors. I participated in her ordination service. She's the African-American pastor of an AME Zion church that left the AME Zion, and, and I'm not sure what it is now. But we would get together about once a month or every other month just to talk about life in our churches, in our denominations. One of the things that I got in the habit of doing was whenever there was an, an incident in Knoxville, say a police issue, something went on, I would call her and say, Jean, what's your community saying about this? And almost every time, almost every time, her perspective was really, really, really different from mine. And we grew together by intentionally trying to bridge as well as bond. Does that make sense? Does that make sense? Let's covenant together to bond and to bridge. At Northside, to bond and to bridge. Let's love theology, but hate the expectations of pseudo-piety. Let's love the gospel, but hate the absolutist moralism that binds us rather than sets us free. Let's love the Bible, but hate the way it's used to, to beat people down. Let's love Jesus, but hate what we've done to him. Week after week, season after season, year after year, let us participate in the drama that is our faith in Jesus Christ. It's not supposed to be fun always. It's not supposed to produce intense emotional response every time we get together. It's a microcosmic, disciplined, anticipatory remembrance of who we are whose we are and who we're meant to be. We need this. We need each other. We need each different other. And to the extent that each of us comes to Jesus and has his or her own relationship with Jesus, who is related then to everyone else, who knows Jesus. To that extent, maybe his prayer was answered after all. Amen.